This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello, Nihao. We are in Greece. Uh, we are in the island of uh, Rhodos uh, in the Aegean. We are at the crossroads of three continents, uh, Europe, Asia and Africa. I'm Fanis Opathenasiou from the Greek public uh, television ERT. And today on this co-production with uh, China's television CGTN, we'll present a special edition for Greece, China, but also we will talk about the challenges for peace and stability globally. At this point, let me introduce my co-host today, my colleague from CGTN, from, uh, she came from China, Liu Xin. Ni hao xin. Yasu, Fanny. Yasu to everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here on the island of Rhodes for the very first time and for a very special occasion. Let me quote a, a Greek philosopher, Socrates, I believe he said this, an unexamined life is not worth living. So let us examine the life of the world order as we speak and let's do it in an inter-civilizational manner i mean greek european chinese jewish and russian is not everything but it's a fair amount and an interesting mix you don't see very often on international tv it's very exciting let's move and uh, let's present our guests okay <laughs> Shall we introduce our let's, distinguished panelists? Yes, uh, let's like start, start? Uh, with uh, Mr. Ehud Olmert, uh, former Prime Minister of Israel. Welcome, Mr. Olmert. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, next to him is uh, Dr. Vladimir Yakunin. Uh, he's the chairman of the uh, supervisory uh, board of DOC, uh, Dialogue of uh, Civilization Research Institute. Welcome, Mr. Yakunin. Thank you. Very Good glad evening. to have you here. Yeah. And to his left <laughs> is uh, Mr. Georgios uh, Katrogalos, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Greece. Welcome. And to his left is Professor Justin Ifu Lin, a senior economist and former senior vice president of the World Bank. Welcome. Welcome to all of you. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, different issues, about world order, peace and stability. We are in the region where uh, a lot of uh, civilization coexisted uh, with tension and war. Uh, not far from here, uh, in Africa and the Middle East, there is still war and tension. Um, I want you, uh, each one of you, all of you, a short comment first. We're going to go deeply afterwards. Uh, what do you think is the number one threat for peace and stability uh, according to you? Is it the war in Syria? Is it uh, the Iran nuclear program? Yeah, what, what, what keeps you Let's start you with away? you, Mr. Olmert. Yeah. I think all of it together. I think the lack of uh, understanding about the uh, division of power uh, amongst the superpowers of the world. Uh, uh, it's changed uh, in the uh, recent past, certainly in the uh, history, there was a clear understanding of who is what, who is the uh, international policeman, who is the partner of the international policeman. Now it seems to somehow shake. So the lack of, uh, uh, who is the, the boss? The lack of discipline amongst the superpowers is a source for potential instability that will find its expressions in different parts of the world. Mm. And I hope that the superpowers will uh, soon come to an understanding about uh, their uh, respective positions okay. in the uh, international community. Dr. Yakune, your answer. After Second World War, the order was established and that gave the legality to the balance of powers and uh, correlations of interest, despite the fact that the world was divided, to polar world. But with the salvation of the Soviet Union, one of the pillow disappeared. So the entire construction of the world order and the international law somehow cracked, if I may say so, and I hope that the Prime Minister will agree with me here, that caused a lot of problems. Besides the new problems, new crises, new challenges, which mankind is facing now, like inequality, like technical progress, and like 
terrorism and many other issues. I see. Mr. Katrugulis, on this, um, do you think, like uh, Mr. Mert suggested, that the international system needs a policeman? And who is the boss today? Well, uh, I think, uh, and this is not the meaning of uh, what uh, Mr. Dr. Yacuni said, that we need uh, a policeman. Quite the opposite. We are now in a multipolar world. The obvious uh, destabilizing factor is not uh, the existence of uh, two camps, but the weakening of multilateralism. Uh, saying that, I don't think that we should idealize the status quo ante before the current uh, American administration, the international world order, was not neither fair nor equitable. Look at the Security Council. Africa is missing. Uh, uh, South America is missing. India is missing. And look also at the imbalance of interests regarding inequality. Uh, according to my perspective, my personal perspective, in the long term, what we should tackle is exactly this imbalance of interests mm -hmm. and especially the inequalities and more specifically within our part of the world, uh, the West, because there is that we have now an explosion of inequalities unprecedented. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Professor Lin, from an economist point of view, what is the biggest concern for you in today's world order? I think the most important concerns are poverty, nationalism, and hegemony. And they are related. Because when a country is poor, then they may cause some kind of issue or social political stabilities. And uh, you know, when a country turns into the nationalism, very often they try to do some policy which seemingly good for their nation, but at the cost of other nations. And then when you have hegemonies, sometimes the country want to maintain the power and uh, deprive the opportunity for other countries to grow, to have development. And I think those three things are the three traits to the world's stability and uh, security. So poverty, nationalism, and hegemony indeed yeah. are very big concepts, very big problems. But shall we break down <coughs> the world and try to look at some hot spots so that we have a better understanding of the world we are living in, or maybe um, try to understand situ the situation okay. better? Shall we start? Let's start with uh, China. With China, okay. Since we are here in <coughs> Greece, and uh, I'm Chinese, we are on Chinese TV, so, shall I start with uh, Minister Kato Galos? What is the status quo of Greek, Greek relations with China? I understand that Greece just signed a memorandum of understanding on the Belt and Road Initiative with China. So, how do the Greek government and do the Greek people look at relations with China? We consider China a strategic partner. First of all, we have an immense respect uh, towards the Chinese civilization, be ourselves an ancient uh, civilization. Besides that, our characteristic of uh, our foreign policy is its uh, multidimensionality. We are, of course, in the European Union. Our home is the European Union. But we want to become a country moderator bridge towards other countries, Russia, <coughs> the Arab world, China, and especially we want to develop our economic ties with the rising superpower which is China. China doesn't call itself a superpower, <laughs> by the way. And, uh, I see, that's why I try to use a descriptive term, rising superpower. Mm -hmm. Okay, so rising. I, it, it is related to what uh, Professor has said. Mm -hmm. China has always had a different uh, conception about hegemony and mm -hmm. uh, it, its uh, role. And for this reason, I think it is not um, contradictory for us to want Europe to have a special political clout and in tandem to work economic ties with China. I think it's completely yeah. in the same line of having a better world. Yeah. Okay, let's see the views of uh, Benzin. Uh, Professor Lin, what is uh, China's, what is Greece's strategic importance for China? And uh, could Greece become the bridge between uh, China and the rest of Europe? I think that, uh, you know, China is a rising country. And uh, currently, China is the largest trading nation in the world. China is the second largest economy in the world. And very soon, maybe by the time of 2025, China will be a high-income country. 
And certainly, China need to take more responsibility for the global development. And uh, the Bear and Road initiate, Initiative tried to provide a vision for the common prosperity in the world. And certainly, you know, Greece and other countries around the Bear and Road certainly you know, can participate in this opportunity and uh, to address the issue of how to achieve common possibility for human communities. And so do you see uh, Greece as an important ally, ally as a gateway, Greece as a gateway to Europe and Africa? Well, certainly Europe <coughs> certainly first is a destination. And Europe is also a gateway to Africa and also to America because we like to have an integrated world and so we can and explore the opportunity together for the development in every country. Mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister, let me ask your point of view on China's economic globalization. I mean, Israel is also a very active supporter of the Belt and Road Initiative. It is one of the founding members of the AIIB, the China Infrastructure Investment Bank. How do you look at China's economic globalization and its potential meaning to regional blocs such as the EU? Well, first of all, I have a personal dimension with regard to China, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I guess, different from the uh, other Europeans. My family grew up in China. My parents lived in China. Uh, and they uh, grew up in Harbin, which is a major city in China. Yes. So the parts of the, my family are still there. My grandfather is wow. buried in China, in Harbin. And uh, therefore, it has a very special emotional dimension for me. And uh, I was uh, always very anxious uh, in my different capacities in the government to develop the uh, relations uh, between Israel and China. Because for me, in a certain way, China was like a second homeland. Uh, so, so how do you look at Chinese companies going abroad, so, building uh, railways? Well, you know, when I was uh, Minister of Industry and Trade, uh, like 16 uh, years ago, I uh, promoted very much the uh, economic cooperation between Israel and China. I already, it was clear that China is emerging as a, a rising superpower. You don't like the uh, term, but... I don't uh, like the a, term. As a rising, <laughs> as a rising, yeah. as a rising okay. economic power. Yes. And uh, as the professor correctly said, of course, it's the second largest economy and it will become, maybe in five years or seven years, it will be the first economy in the world. China is anxious mm. to, uh, first of all, I think, to uh, provide quality life for 1.4 billion Chinese. Absolutely, yes. And this is the major, the most important challenge for China. And I think that the way to connect with China and to become uh, important for China is to understand what is the priority of the uh, Chinese people as far as they are concerned, and to see how you can become part of this effort. Um, for instance, I remember that uh, the uh, Chinese President Yang Zemin, former president, mm -hmm. said that his dream is uh, every Chinese uh, <laughs> child will drink one glass of milk, fresh mm -hmm. milk, every day. That goal has been so, reached quite uh, a while ago, I, I think. I, yeah. uh, started uh, an effort which resulted in building up cow farms uh, with the assistance of the Israeli technologies mm -hmm. in China and there are many many such farms now in China producing lots of milk and so on. China is a major player in the world economy Yes. and uh, what we try to do in Israel is as I said to try and coordinate uh, with uh, the uh, main priorities of China that are synchronized with the needs of China, which okay. is to provide quality life for 1.4 billion people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Yakunin, uh, a lot of people in the West, though, 
they they fear they raising fear about uh, China's growing political influence in Europe in the Balkans. Uh, uh, they see it that it, the Belt and uh, Road Initiative is more than economic uh, dominance. Do you buy this view? Uh, they, do, you, do they really fear uh, China? Listen, so if we are talking about rank and file sentiments, you know those sentiments are being growing up because of the, um, may I say, propaganda which is being distributed through the mass media, through the social uh, networks, etc. If we are talking objectively, it is inevitable that the world is changing. Take the recent uh, report on, uh, of McKenzie about the developing, emerging economies overcoming the G7 economies. This is the fact. So be objective. If it is the fact, take the fact at the face value and then decide what is your place. But you know, when that kind of sentiments, listen, Chinese are coming or Russians uh, were coming or something like that, that is, I suppose, a very poor politi political games, nothing more. Let us look into the substance. China, and you know, I'm not buying the term rising superpower or superpower because you know my experience with the Chinese uh, leading people with Chinese uh, politicians is showing that you know they do understand that you know if they accept the idea of rising superpower then immediately they will be squeezed into very narrow niche of being superpower being gendarme, being what? Instead, the initiative, one bell, one road, as it used to be, and bell and road, as you mm -hmm. call it now, suggested, you know, equal participation. When China is suggesting to, say, developing country, listen, we can give money, we can mm -hmm. uh, provide technology to construct infrastructure. Yeah. But it is for you to decide whether you want it or Absolutely. not. And yeah. if you take it, then you take responsibility. That's, I think that's what Greece did, right? At times of trouble, Chinese investment was here, Chinese help was here, and Greece took it. However, Greece came under quite a bit of pressure from its European neighbors saying uh, China has some kind of uh, political influence on, on Greece's uh, foreign policy. How do you look at that kind of? Did, did Greece feel pressure from China to do certain things? Not at all. I think one of the <coughs> most distinctive characters of the Chinese uh, investment uh, uh, policy is the lack of any kind of conditionality. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that because we have suffered in Greece from other types mm -hmm. of uh, conditionality. And exactly because we have to be quite open and quite frank, what we have seen, uh, uh, what I see personally as really problematic in the last uh, decades was exactly the dominance of a neoliberal what we call usually Washington consensus mm -hmm. in the conditionality of what we have offered as West mm -hmm. to Africa, for instance. And this is at the roots of the problem of Africa not being now at the same, uh, on the same track as Asia or uh, the other uh, rising mm -hmm. powers in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the earth. So uh, we have explained to our economy, uh, to our uh, European partners that we do not have objections on their uh, uh, behalf that we need the Chinese uh, uh, investments in order to go back uh, to growth and uh, I must tell you that we would not receive any kind of political objections yeah. from, by them. Yeah. On the other hand, Mr. Katrukalos, uh, there are a lot of European countries like uh, Germany uh, that uh, they support that uh, unless European Union forms a policy against China, uh, Europe will be divided. Uh, no, the divisions in Europe uh, are irrelevant uh, with uh, the Chinese uh, rise. Uh, it's an, look, if you look globally, the human history, China was always, if not the number one power, number one or number two. India was uh, the number one industrial power mm -hmm. just before the, the British going there as a colonial power. So it is a good thing that at the global level we have now a less imbalanced uh, uh, situation. <coughs> what is important for Europe, however, 
is uh, to become unified, to overcome its internal divisions and have political clout in the world. But it is not uh, in hostility or in uh, opposition with any other country, China or whatever others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask a question from the Chinese perspective, hearing all the uh, foreign perspectives, Professor Lin. However, China's Belt and Road Initiative, um, as is turning five, uh, is the Chinese government and Chinese investors doing some kind of soul searching as to where to go in the next steps? Um, are they readjusting their investment strategies? Are they aware of the kind of doubts that Chinese investment are arousing in the recipient uh, countries and regions? I think I'd like to go back to the question we just discussed. I do notice in the media in the West, sometimes they judge China, mm -hmm. but they based on their own experiences. Mm -hmm. Because in the past, when they went in one country, in general, they want to grasp, they want to dominate. And now they see that China is coming, and they think, well, China should behave <laughs> with the same motivation, same intention as we were in the past. But I think the Chinese philosophy is somewhat different. You know, according to the Confucianism, if we want to make ourselves prosperous, then we need to help the other country, the other people to be prosperous. Mm. When we want to make us strong, we also need to make the other people to be strong. I think that is a philosophy of China. As I mentioned, China certainly become increasingly important in terms of its economic weight. Mm -hmm. And China soon will become a high-income country. Certainly, we will have this kind of responsibility. Certainly, mm -hmm. we want to be prosperous, yeah. and we want to grow more. But at the same time, unless our neighbors, people in the world, can also enjoy this kind of prosperity, but otherwise China cannot be prosperous by China itself. Okay. I think the Bear and Road Initiative is along the line of thinking. And certainly, when China go to a country to do the investment, as Mr. You know, that uh, 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 Kuni just mentioned, it's a uh, cooperation. Okay. We need so what's to have happening a mutual next? agreement, right? It's yeah. an investment. What's happening next? Yeah. In the next five years, what can we expect of this <coughs> initiative? Well, certainly, you know, if you look into the train, because the Bear and Road Initiative has been welcomed by many countries like our Greece friend, and uh, in Africa, in Central Asia, in Europe, and I do see you know, this kind of trend will be accelerated. We are going to see, have to see more projects in many other countries. Mm -hmm. And that's what should be good for all the countries. Because okay. we know the bottleneck for growth in most countries are infrastructure. And if okay. we can have infrastructure connectivities, it will pave the foundation for every country to remove their bottleneck of growth. And then maybe we have the opportunity to enjoy the common prosperity in the coming years. Okay, let's okay. come closer to our region. Let's uh, go to okay. the Middle East. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs>
You're watching CGTN. Coming to you from my room. Guys, I'm members of business of the Mark, what more can you tell us about events happening there? The politics this is a pretty picture. Hundred dollars. I mean, of the uh, event. Yeah, Charlie, you're on the second time back over to Beijing. To go after the yeah. 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 all about the dance. Yeah. Look at all the yeah. This is CGTN. CGTN. See the difference. Uh, let's uh, go to the issue uh, and the tension between Israel and uh, Russia lately. There is a, a tension lately because of Syria. Uh, let's uh, go to Mr. Holmert. Uh, what is next uh, on the Israeli-Russian uh, relation? Uh, we saw recently there is a tension for many reasons in Syria. And, we have uh, no intention. Russia's, Russia's uh, decision to install the S-300 missiles in Syria uh, increased the tension. Uh, what is your views? I think that uh, this is uh, an unnecessary development. And, uh, on the other hand, I don't think that we should blow it out of its real proportions. Israel and Russia are not enemies, and we are not going to be enemies. I don't think that Russia has any particular agenda against Israel. Mm -hmm. I have uh, known the president <coughs> of Russia for many years. I've dealt with him. I uh, negotiated with him. And uh, I'm confident that uh, uh, Vladimir Putin doesn't have anything uh, particular uh, against Israel that should uh, worry uh, Israel. However, it is obvious that Russia is cooperating with uh, enemies of the state of Israel, not be because Russia has an agenda against Israel, but because this is the interpretation of Russia, a legitimate interpretation of Russia, of what the Russian interests are. Mm -hmm in this part of the world. I, uh, I think that um, uh, the president of Russia is fully aware of the complexities and the sensitivities and the possible potential unnecessary developments which may arise out of this very sensitive situation and it will be taken care of. Uh, I regret that the, uh, Russia provided Syria with the S-300 Mm -hmm. At the time that I was Prime Minister and I negotiated with uh, uh, President Putin about it, he once said to me, uh, why do you have to be afraid of the missiles? They are defensive missiles. So if your planes will not be above Damascus or above uh, Latakia, which is the uh, harbor city, uh, you will not meet my missiles. But then a year later, when Russia was uh, very upset with the potential deployment of American missiles on the border of Russia mm -hmm. in the Czech Republic and in Poland, and uh, President Putin talked with me about it, I said to Mr. Putin, Mr. Putin, why are you concerned about the missiles? They are defensive missiles. If your planes will not be above Warsaw <laughs> or above Prague, you will not meet the American missiles. Okay, and let's, he let's look at the status quo. We let's look at the current situation here in the Middle East, especially in Syria. Uh, the United States' presence, influence is uh, weakening. The That's presence right. of uh, Russia is uh, uh, strengthening for Israel. What does that represent? But again, I don't think that uh, Russia is an enemy of Israel. So, no, but uh, the fact that I, the U.S. Regret, influence is weakening. I, I regret the lack of balance, and that's what I said before. When you ask me about the general situation in the world, I said the lack of balance and the change of priorities amongst uh, certain countries uh, certainly influences the can stability. You, can you elaborate on this? What, what change? What, who changed uh, priorities? Uh, uh, America. Is it, is it Washington that changed priorities? Uh, absolutely. And what's the implications of that? The yeah. implication is that America is becoming less influential in the Middle East and Russia is becoming more influential in the yeah. Middle East. Maybe it's their decision. Pardon? Maybe <coughs> it's uh, American's decision. No doubt about it. It certainly is American decision. They are uh, pulling out their forces uh, from uh, the Middle East and it does have an influence which it is quite noticeable. The problem that I have with the Russian influence, I am not afraid 
of any attempt by Russia uh, that can jeopardize okay. Israeli security, and okay. I don't think that Russia has any such idea. Let's let's but hear from just with the fact that Russia allowed a military presence of Iran in Syria is something mm -hmm. that should have been avoided, and Israel will not acquiesce with it. Okay. And this is a source for unnecessary uh, complexities mm -hmm. that should be dismissed mm -hmm. by pulling out Iran from where they don't belong. Okay, uh, Dr. Yakunin, I know you don't see yourself as a representative of the Russian side of the opinion, but from being a Russian, <laughs> do you agree with what uh, Prime Minister just said about Russia's influence and the unnecessary moves or unnecessary <coughs> I completely agree there where the Prime Minister is saying there is no any kind of hostility between Russia and Israel. I would like to remind you that unlike in many Western countries, in uh, Tel Aviv or Jerusalem even, you know, you can see some kind of celebration of Victory Day on the 9th of May. And when in first time in 1995 I visited Israel, you know, I was impressed that, you know, on the corner of the street there was a Russian-speaking uh, person singing Katyusha. And that was in 1995. And I am living with this impression. In, in the city that I was the mayor of, in yeah. Jerusalem. Listen, and I'm living with this impression. Of course, when we are talking about political games, political interests, it is absolutely absurd not to respect the interests of all the interested parties, if I may say so. And you know, when, for example, Mr. Trump declares, I don't know if you know, you agree with me, that we transfer the capital mm -hmm. of Israel to Jerusalem, yes. forgetting about the resolution of the United Nations, that is causing problem. Of course, we can have it between Israel and Russia, we can have some arguments, you know, we can differently yeah. see the situation, but that is not disbalancing the relations between Russia and Israel. Okay, Prime Minister, you have to answer this. What do you think of the U.S.'s move to, to bring the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? Is that uh, Look, I, what the U.S.? Uh, I was the mayor of the city of Jerusalem for 10 years, mm -hmm. and I always thought that uh, it should have been uh, recognized as the capital of the state of Israel. When Israel was declared, and it was declared the capital, it, uh, every country is entitled to declare its capital. And mm -hmm. uh, Jerusalem was declared the capital of the state of Israel in December of 1949, and it should have been recognized by the international community. It is well known, and I've made it clear, and it uh, has been discussed many times uh, across the uh, world, so I can say it that I propose the Palestinians to recognize the Arab part of Jerusalem as the capital of the Palestinians. So from the, my point of view, the uh, western part of Jerusalem is the natural capital of the state of Israel. The Arab part of Jerusalem is the natural capital of the Palestinian people. And I also propose that the Holy Basin, which includes the old city of Jerusalem, which is very important for Christians, for Muslims, for Jews, and for many other religions, should be administered by an international trust made of the Saudis, At this moment, of Jordan, is it still of possible? Israel. At this pa moment, is that, pol is that scenario still possible, given the UN's policy in the, in the Middle East? The, uh, the transfer, the, the uh, partial <coughs> recognition, let's put yeah. it in the right place, they moved the embassy to the western part of Jerusalem and they say that the final borders of Jerusalem will be determined in negotiations. So this does not interfere or should not disturb a political process of negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. I think that there is a peace plan which can be accepted. This is my peace plan. Yeah. Two weeks ago I met with Dr. Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian uh, community in uh, Paris, and he repeatedly uh, say that uh, we were very, very close yeah. to make an agreement on the basis of my plan, and I still think that it can be done today or okay. tomorrow okay. or in a month's time. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, uh, do you think though that it was, it could be in a different way? Did, did, did you did you like the way 
uh, the America moved, uh, did that move, it caused a lot of uh, lives of the Palestinians. Don't you think that uh, the, with the applications it would have been a different way, it would be different ways to, to do that move in a different environment? Look, you know, I <coughs> sufficiently fight with my political rivals in Israel. Now you want to uh, to uh, <laughs> no? Uh, I want you. I want you to say. I want because to because I know your opinions. The, the I know. I know America. that. I know that you disagree in a way. And I want your no, opinion. I, I, let's put it this way. As I said, I really. Th By the way, the uh, the American the transfer of the embassy to Jerusalem didn't cause the death of one person in Jerusalem, and not in the territories. There was not any major confrontation in Jerusalem. The confrontations were in Gaza. And the reactions were in Gaza. In yeah, Gaza but it is was something story. that was expected. Yeah. Pardon? It was something that was expected. Listen, the, the Gaza is, look, Gaza is controlled by a terrorist organization, which is recognized as such by the international community. Okay. Hamas is a terrorist organization. I think for and this what they are doing in Gaza has nothing to do with the transfer of the embassy. Okay, well, the I transfer think... of the embassy is an issue, as I said, I am personally and I propose it as Prime Minister of Israel, that Jerusalem, the Arab part of Jerusalem, will be the capital of the Palestinians. Yeah. And I think that at the end of the day, this will be. Okay, Prime Minister, we have to leave it there because there we, yeah. this is not an exclusive, <laughs> exclusive discussion about Middle East. But, but since I, we have the chance yeah, uh, I know. Uh, but we Prime do Minister, want, okay, yeah, yeah, of course, we want the opinion of the others. I do want to get the uh, view of uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Greece upon your uh, policy in the Middle East. You are a member of the European Union, so you should side with the European position. However, you are also your government <coughs> is also a very close friend to the White House. Uh, in terms of the Iran deal, when uh, President Trump decided to withdraw from that deal, what is uh, the biggest question for you? Look, if uh, you ask me which is the most uh, salient, uh, the most uh, constant, uh, the most fundamental, I would say respect uh, of international law and United Nations resolutions. So we want that for Cyprus. Mm. We want that in any part of the world. And uh, I would like uh, to the previous discussion to add that this is the solution also in, uh, in Israel and the Palestine, two states. Recognition of the right of, to Israel to have safety and security in its own state and simultaneously recognition to the Palestinians of the right to have their own state. And what worries me in the area is exactly that we have a weakening of the voices of peace that want this solution. <coughs> Regarding our stance to in the Middle East, we have never been a colonial power. We have always had diasporas integrated in, uh, in uh, uh, all these uh, uh, counties of the area. And we want to have uh, good solutions with our Arab friends and also with Israel, with which we have developed recently comes, closer ties. Yeah, when it comes to the Iran deal, actually I was talking about the Iran, Iran deal. Iran is exactly um, a deal that should be respected, exactly because it has been forged after years of effort and exactly because it's part of the this multilateralism that we should defend. Yeah, but this is not being respected, at least by the United States. I mean, the Iran deal, right? We are trying as the Europeans, not Greece is a small country to play in this big game of interests. Yeah. But we contribute actively to what the European Union is trying to yeah. do to build its own mechanism to neutralize uh, the bad effects of mm -hmm. this uh, uh, put into question. I, have, uh, I will ask a, a general question about power of shifting in the Middle East. Uh, there are some uh, analysts that argue, Mr. Yakunin, that um, with the case of uh, Syria, that Rosa lately gains the control of the Middle East and Americans at the same time losing control in the Middle East and Americans uh, play better ball, let's say, in the Balkans. Uh, Russia is in decreasing its influence in the Balkans. What is, what is your views? I don't think this is a correct assumption that <coughs> with Syria and deal, Russia won the control of the Mediterranean. It is just not relevant to say. I guess, uh, you know, from this perspective, as a Russian citizen, what I can say, I know many people in different regions, I am traveling a lot. Mm -hmm. In Africa, there are a big community of former students from the Russian universities, right? 
in Israel, there is a great community of the people came from Russia, not only from China, Prime Minister, but from Russia also. Actually, <laughs> many more from Russia than yes. from China. Yes. But my family came from China. Okay. <laughs> but they were born in Russia. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so There's you the see, connection. You see, and you know, I suppose the move of Russia was generally met with respect. I will remind you, you know, the first time the world community suddenly understood that, you know, convoys coming from Syrian territory to uh, uh, Turkish territory, they were carrying illegal, illegal oil for the sale. We all know that nowadays with sophisticated financial system, it is not possible for me to pay a dollar without being, you know, controlled by appropriate bank, right? So how comes that, you know, only after the military planes of Russia destroyed the convoy, the entire world suddenly uh, understood this. Mm. So that is kind of the feature of actual fighting terrorism, not trying to gain, you know, overwhelming control over Mediterranean. Firstly, it is not possible. Secondly, I don't uh, believe that is the target. Okay. okay. Yeah. Let's move we have, to... Yeah, we have... One many thing more. must be still uh, emphasized, and uh, uh, I think that we can't just leave this without saying it, that I don't disagree with uh, the analysis of uh, Professor E. Kunin about uh, the role of Russia. Just one thing to remember. The president of Syria, which is supported by Russia, has killed more than 500,000 of his own citizens. He butchered them, he killed them in Syria. This is unforgettable and unforgivable. Okay. Has to be remembered when we talk about this. Okay. Issue. Professor Lin, you want to add something on this subject? From an academic pers perspective, we hope that peace and prosperity can be achieved. And the better way to achieve peace and prosperity is put the issue on the table okay. and address the issue through diplomacy instead of war, fight, conflicts. Okay. And I hope those kind of rationality can prevail. Yeah. Well, okay. diplomatic ways, I wonder what's the definition of diplomatic ways? Do tariffs count as diplomatic ways? Because you're not using weapons. Uh, and it depends. I, I, might be, you know, in our times there are uh, trade wars, there are other kind of wars, exactly. economic wars, sanctions, so let's go to the subject of exactly. the trade war between the United wars. States. <laughs> not shooting with weapons, but shooting with tariffs. Okay. That's why we, we want so to talk a little bit about trade, this issue trade here. War between I don't the United think that States this war <coughs> will benefit any of the participants. Mm -hmm. And I think that soon enough they will understand that it's not the way to run the world economy. My Who country, should understand? Are you saying the U.S. or the Chinese? Both U.S. and China, both of them. But China understand. believes it is the United States who well, started they, they, this. They, look, China believes that this is the United States. The United States believes that China is exercising a lot of influence that uh, gives China a certain advantage in the world trade. And they will have to come to an understanding this war can't be won by yeah. anyone. Yeah, but it seems that, uh, I agree with you, it seems that, that both countries, and not only this, and because there are implications for Europe, for all over the world, they are in a deadlock. It doesn't lead anywhere. Mm. Look, uh, the, it appears to be a deadlock. I hope that with sufficient wisdom, flexibility, and I may say compassion, okay. both countries will ultimately come to terms uh, because as I said I think from you know our side perspective Israel is too small to be a big player in this war I mean we are not we look at it and I can <coughs> say no one can win this war all of us can lose by the way all of us not just okay. China and America but many others and therefore they will have to they will have to come to terms mm -hmm. and I believe they will have they will come to terms and it will be resolved in a manner which will be good enough for America for China and for those many millions of people in Africa 
and in the Middle East, yeah. which are greatly influenced of by course. the economies and trade policy of these two countries. Yeah. Professor Lin, um, but at this moment, we are not seeing any signs that uh, the tensions are easing, right? We are seeing signs of the opposite direction. Uh, does the Chinese leadership understand the rationale behind the U.S.'s behavior? Does the Chinese have a way out of this crisis or suggestion to come out of this crisis? Well, actually, U.S. has some problems. Trade deficit certainly is a problem. But the issue is that the trade deficit in the U.S. was caused by China or not. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that first. But actually, from all the academic studies, but not the they agree deficit. the trade deficit in the U.S. is because U.S. consume too much, spend too much. And it's not because of China that causing the trade deficit in the U.S. And actually, certainly, if you look into the absolute amount of the U.S. trade deficit with China, it seems to be very large. But the percentage of the U.S. trade deficit with China actually was declining in the past year first. And uh, especially, U.S. US, US always has some trade deficit with its Asian economies since the 1960s and so on. And uh, in the height of 1980s, more than 100% of the U.S. trade deficit came from East Asia because East Asian export those kind of more labor-intensive, you know, lower-value right. product but to it the seems, U.S. U.S. Professor Lin, yeah. country. But it seems that the U.S. is not mentioning the word trade deficit or the words <laughs> trade deficit anymore. They're talking about uh, China being a, a, an interference in the U.S. political um, activity, I try. Thought that they were complaining about the Russians. So yeah, but no, did you? Politics. But the no, most no, region, the, <laughs> position. the headline was that uh, Russia pales in comparison to China when it comes to meddling in the U.S. politics. So, what are we looking at? Is it a comprehensive uh, confrontation uh, between okay. the two sides? So let's look into the realities. Certainly, you know, the Trump mentioned that and uh, Vice President Pence mentioned that. But the head of the communication denied that. They say there's no evidence that China, you know, measuring the U.S. election and so on. That's from their authorities. Mm -hmm. The person who are responsible for the communication in the U.S. deny that China intervened in the U.S. election. Before, yeah. before we move to uh, our other um, set of questions, Mr. Katrugulos, uh, on this, on the trade war, uh, what is the implications for the European countries? Well, nobody is profiting from wars, <laughs> trade wars <laughs> included. <laughs> and sometimes the in-betweens have more victims. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, I was looking at the forecast about the Greek maritime fleet. Mm -hmm. are, it may be influenced uh, severely by the uh, fall of international uh, commerce if this uh, uh, trade war continues. But the most striking thing is another side of the European policy, a very weak European reply to that. Not a unified position because of different interests among the big counties in the European Union. And this uh, uh, reasserts our position as Greece that Europe must be much more proactive in, in the future. Um, Dr. Yakunin, how do you look at the trade war between China and the United States? Is this a symptom of a deeper problem with the world order we're looking at? The hegemony, the, the declining or relative decline of the U.S.'s hegemonic power compared to the rising China? Is that part of the equation? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is not just, you know, assumption that China intervened with the, some political processes in uh, the United States of America. You know, uh, Professor Lin just uh, mentioned, you know, debt of the uh, United States budget. But the entire model is a debt model. So we are talking about global perspective. This is not only the problem of the United States of America. This is not only the problem between China and the United States of America. That is the, exactly the problem of global economy. 
that's why, you know, in the recent publications of Rome Club or um, uh, Nobel laureate Stiglitz, both, uh, both uh, sources are saying that, you know, the change is inevitable. The model should be changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from this perspective, I suppose it is somehow uh, not very professional uh, to use, uh, you know, the assumption that, okay, China is rising and because of that, you know, China is acquiring some benefits from the relations, trade relations with the United States of America. The problem is not that. The problem is that China is rising and rising much faster and now it is competitive to the United States of America. Yes. And suddenly the world sovereign, if I may say so, dominating power something somehow understood okay. that you know that is the challenge we cannot behave like we behaved you know many many years before okay. something changed okay since we have you here mr uh, dr jakunin and mr katrugos uh, a word about the greek russian uh, relations listen you won't believe we were sitting in the chair I know, I know. waiting for these you know performance and we're talking about that and you know historically we should remember that independent Greece occurred due to the, uh, you know, fighting of the Russian troops. And the first president of uh, Greece, Mr. Kapadastri, he was on the service for the Russian Tsar. So from this and from the perspective of uh, mutually, uh, you know, sharing uh, orthodox beliefs, we are close nations. And, you know, whatever politically wise we observe, that is the substance of the relations between two people and be, uh, between two countries. Mm -hmm. uh, a word from Mr. Katrugalos. It's obvious that uh, Russia is one of the countries with which we have uh, friendly and uh, uh, long-lasting relationships. I would like just uh, to repeat what our Prime Minister said to the similar question in, in Salonika that recently we had uh, some problems uh, because we believe that uh, mutual respect must reign mm -hmm. even and even more in the relationships between uh, friends but now we are in a phase to okay. overcome these uh, difficulties okay i think uh, we have to wrap it here uh, an hour goes by so fast many thanks to our distinguished we could have panelists discussed for hours yeah. about our issues the world is too big <laughs> <laughs> okay but, yeah many Let's thanks once again to our four panelists mr ehud olmert former prime minister of israel Thank dr you. vladimir yakunin chairman of the supervisory board of the dialogue of civilizations research institute and uh, Mr. Katrugalos, George Katrugalos, Deputy Foreign Minister of Greece. Uh, Mr. Lin, Professor Lin, uh, thank you so much for being here, uh, for having us, uh, for giving us the opportunity to have you here. Thank you so much, sir. And thank I want to thank you and uh, CGTN for this uh, excellent show. Uh, thank you, Fanny, and many thanks to ERC for this wonderful production. I really thank enjoyed you. it. Okay, let's uh, renew our. Uh, uh, show for next year. You come to Beijing? Okay, <laughs> I come to Beijing. You come again. <laughs>